In today's session, three key steps to getting the right color. We will review some color management fundamentals and we will examine how to optimize color settings and calibration to attain the most predictable color output. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Lou Prestia, Product Line Manager, and Veronica Carlson, Senior Product Marketing Manager. So without further delay, let's begin our presentation. Veronica, take it away. Thank you, Yael. Hello, everyone. We are very excited to be here with you today. Before we begin, let's start by getting to know you better and ask you two simple questions. You can see them now on your screen. The first one is about your color management experience. Let us know which option describes you the best. And the second question is about what kind of digital printers you have or use. So please select all that apply. Okay. So let's uh, get started with this first webinar by presenting you the agenda we prepared for you today. First of all, we'll start with this question. Why does color management matter? And I'm sure we all know why, otherwise you couldn't be here with us today, right? But the answer to that question in the context of this session will give us even more reasons why our time today and in the next sessions of the color series is a time well invested. Right after, Lou will spend just a few minutes covering the basics of color. We are sure, pretty sure that most of you know some concepts of color theory and color management at this point, but to make sure we are all in the, uh, we have all a common understanding, we need to cover just a few concepts so everybody is on the same page. After that, we'll dive into the three key steps to getting the color you want. First, by understanding how to make color settings at the rip match the ones from the native applications. Second, understand the basics of color calibration. And third, the ins and outs of profiling. So, why is it important to understand color management? First and foremost, having control of the color you produce is one of the keys for customer retention. Understanding how it works and its limitations is a great start but also have your customer understand those as well. Do your customers understand why they should submit their jobs in RGB color space in order to maximize the gamut of colors your printer can reproduce? Make them understand the limitations that what they're printing at their office is not going to match with what you can print at your shop, that the colors they see in their monitors will not be the same as the color on paper and why that is not a realistic expectation. If you understand color management and why you need to be on top of it, you'll save time. You'll say goodbye to those days when you keep on experimenting on color settings on a job-by-job -job basis just to keep your customer happy. And you'll save money, be more profitable, since you will not need to reprint those jobs for free any longer. You'll make the same money with less clicks, because jobs will come out with accurate and consistent color the first time you try. Now Lou is going to take you to a quick review of the color basics. Lou, take it away. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining our World of Fiery session today. Before we can learn a little bit more about color management and how it works on your digital front end for your digital printing system or inkjet, I want to bring us all onto the same page, if you will, about the basics of how color works and how color management works. I know some of you on the session today are probably already very expert on this so you can just kind of read along with me here and we'll make sure that everybody understands this sort of on the same level before we proceed. The first thing I want to talk about is the color space we're probably all most familiar with which is RGB color. RGB color by definition is what we call device dependent. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The nature of the RGB color model is that the colors red and green and blue add up together to form white. So sometimes this is called the additive color model. This goes back to the experiment you might remember from grammar school where they, you went in a dark room and you had three flashlights, red and a green and a blue filtered flashlight on a, on a wall. And you learned that you could combine those colors to make different colors as we see on this slide. But again, the most important thing is that where all those colors combine at the center, we form white. As soon as we talk about RGB color, 
and remind you that all of your capture devices, such as cameras and scanners, if you still have any scanners around, and all your monitors work in RGB, the first question that comes back about printing color is, why can't I just print with the RGB colors? And the answer is, RGB colors are by their definition opaque. So if you think about a red fire truck, the fire truck is red because it absorbs some of the light and reflects some other of the light. If we simplify for a moment or for a few moments here our understanding of white light, the light that's all around us, you look at this slide, you can see that white light is the combination of red and green and blue light, essentially, in equal combinations. So this is a simpler way for us to think about this while we understand this. So if we talk about the red fire truck, the red fire truck absorbs the green wavelengths, absorbs the blue wavelengths, and reflects the red wavelengths. By its very nature of reflecting red, we know that it's opaque, which is to say we can't see through the fire truck. So if I try to print a color, let's try to print a purple color. So I put some RGB inks into my press, and I put down the order so that I print the red down first and the blue second, and I print a combination of red and blue that on my monitor looked like it made a terrific purple. If we look at this sample here, you can see the substrate on the bottom and the inks piled up that I've printed on my press. Let's go back to our simple model of understanding white light which is to say that white light is equal combination of red and green and blue light. Just like the fire truck, what's going to happen to the red light? The red light's going to be absorbed by the blue. The green light is also going to be absorbed by the blue. Blue light is going to reflect off the blue and back to the observer's eye. The only problem is your customer will say, where's my purple? Well, you could get out there on the press and start scraping blue ink off the sheet to show them there's red behind it but there's no way you're going to get those RGB colors to combine to give the illusion of the purple color that you saw on the screen without using a purple ink. Let's talk about another device dependent color model and again I'll come back to this device dependency in just a minute. CMYK is the color model with, with which we print. Cyan, magenta, and yellow are sometimes called the subtractive color space because as we add these together, we go away from white, and when we combine all three of them, we get black, or approximately black. So the way I'm going to use CMYK color is I'm going to use these as transparent filters. So these inks are not opaque, but rather transparent. And if I want to print a particular color, like blue in this case, I'm going to put down two of my inks to absorb essentially two-thirds of the visible wavelengths and none or very little of the third color, what we sometimes call the unwanted component, because I want your eye to see that. So what happens here with my simple model of white light with RGB coming out of it? Cyan ink, by definition, transmits green and blue, but absorbs or blocks red. And you see the red portion of the, way of the spectrum getting absorbed by the cyan here. I told you also that cyan transmits green, so we see the green light going through this transparent ink, but magenta is the ink that blocks green. Magenta transmits red and transmits blue. So now, what we have left is the blue transmitted by the magenta, reflected back to the observer's eye, and at this point, I've given the observer the illusion of a blue color without using a blue ink. So that's the basics of how color works and why we print with CMYK. The next topic is the idea of device dependency, which I told you both RGB and CMYK color models are device dependent. This simply means that the appearance of these colors is dependent on the device with which we capture or display them. So there's an example here with a couple computer screens. You can see that they look visibly different. You can get a great example of this if you go into an electronics store, look at the big row of 25 TVs on the top shelf, all broadcasting the exact same channel, but the colors look different from one screen to the other. And you're experiencing the nature of device dependency. When we come to CMYK, this is where this really becomes a business problem for us in the printing industry, because the CMYK values that look 
correct on my digital print engine or my conventional printing press or whatever my final production process is are not going to look the same on any of the other printers in my shop if I just send those same CMYK values. The way we solve the problem of device dependency is we introduce the idea of a device independent color space. LAB is the most popular, if you will, it's the best known and most frequently talked about device independent color space. So LAB is unique in that it is not related to any device and there are really no input or output devices in our workflows that technically use lab. What the lab color space represents is the way a color appears to the standard human observer. This goes back to a series of experiments that started in 1931 in France. This group, the CIE, or the Commission Internationale L'Eclairage, basically did an experiment on a lot of people to see how our eyes work. And they developed this metric, or this color system, and you're actually seeing a plot on the right there of the original XYZ color space from 1931. And they said, we can quantify what a color looks like, okay, with numbers which is very, very important. So how do we bring device independent color into our workflow? The answer is, this is why we need a spectrophotometer. Spectrophotometer, unlike your densitometer in your press room that simply reports density, the spectrophotometer basically reports an invariant description of the color, which I can convert mathematically into LAB or some other device independent color space. So before we go on and talk about color management, Let's just have a basic definition first about color gamut. And if I had a way to ask all of you on the session what you think the device gamut is, I suspect that almost everyone would be able to at least say the device gamut is the total range of colors on my device. So it's the total range of colors that maybe my camera can see, but more importantly from where we produce this, it's the total range of colors that my output device can produce. And you're almost right. The problem with your definition is you have not talked about device dependent or independent space. So the proper definition of gamut is the total reproducible colors expressed in device independent color space. By which I mean, if I look at my computer screen in front of me and I put the brightest red on there possible, it's 255, right? And now I have you do the same thing on your computer screen. You put 255 on your screen. Do they look the same? Absolutely not. It's a device dependent color space. But if I take a spectrophotometer and measure the red on my screen and tell you that it's one, two, three in LAB space and the numbers aren't important here, we measure your screen and see that it's some other combination like four, five, six LAB. Now we have begun to define our problem, which is that the colors are dependent on these devices and don't have the same appearance from one device to another. Now we're ready to understand color management. Color management is the idea of mapping the colors from one device dependent space to another device dependent space through device independent space where we know what the colors look like. Or we can technically say that it's gamut mapping with the object of with the intent of preserving the appearance of objects or colors. We do all this with an ICC profile. An ICC profile is simply an index, or what we sometimes call a lookup table, or a LUT, that defines the mapping of one device dependent space to device independent space. So if we made a profile for your monitor from that measurement of that brightest red, that 255 on your monitor that I said measured 456 in LAB, that would be one entry in this index, in this lookup table. Let's look at how we use these profiles in a, in a workflow. Well, I have one more color gamut slide to, to talk to you about here for a minute. Just to give you an understanding of the challenge that we're dealing with with color management and printing in general, we can see in the projection of the XYZ color space, this is all the colors that are defined in this numerical model, generally your RGB that you see on your monitor or capture with your camera has approximately this shape or this gamut in device independent space. Your offset press has a much, much smaller gamut, okay? This is just the nature of CMY versus RGB. 
And so what you're going to see is that we have a problem where we're going to have to achieve in the course of our color management what we call gamut compression. We have an RGB source file, which is a great way to work because you get the most out of all your output devices. But we're going to have to compress that RGB down to the gamut of our conventional presses we show here, or maybe down to the gamut of some digital device, which as we see here can sometimes give us a little bit more gamut than conventional print. If we look at spot colors, you can also see that spot colors are going to have the same problem. And we'll talk more about spot colors in a few minutes, but you can see that they're well out of gamut of the conventional or even the digital press. And so we're also going to experience gamut compression of the spot colors, which is simply to say your customer is going to be disappointed if they use a very bright Pantone color that looked great on their screen and you convert it to CMYK when you print it on your digital or conventional press. Now we'll talk about this workflow. So the way I use ICC profiles is I use ICC profiles to convert from one color space into or out of device independent color space. Start with a simple example. I have an RGB image on the page. Maybe it's Adobe RGB or sRGB or one of these standard color spaces in Photoshop. The ICC profile that I'm going to use here is used to convert the device dependent RGB values into LAB or into this device dependent space where basically I say that's what the color looks like. Now I want to take that appearance and render it on my output device. I'm going to always need a second output pro a second ICC profile. This profile we use in reverse rather than converting from device to device independent we use it to convert from device independent space the LAB values that tell me what the colors look like to device dependent CMYK on our output device, which is our digital presses we're showing here. If I have CMYK inputs, which we know we all do, I'm also going to need to define a source profile or an input profile that tells me for every combination of cyan plus magenta plus yellow plus black in that source file, what's it supposed to look like? What should the LAB values be to tell me how that appears? And again, I can map through LAB space and through my output profile to look up a different CMYK recipe to give me the same appearance as the way the CMYK appeared in the source file. I told you we'd come to spot colors, so let's talk just for a minute about spot colors. Spot colors are, by definition, colors that on a conventional press we print with separate inks if we really want to match them. On the digital front end and all your digital devices, if you have color management in place, you have a distinct advantage because you can actually convert your spot colors directly to the output color space. And again, as we showed on that earlier slide, if you have a little bit more gamut than conventional press, you're going to get a better match to the spot color than if you just looked up the CMYK equivalents in Photoshop or in your Pantone fan book. So I'll show you one more slide about how this works. But I want to remind you, and we'll give you more detail at the end, that our next World of Fiery webinar will actually be entirely about brand colors and spot colors and how to properly color manage these in your workflow. So I'm hopeful that we'll have you attend that one too. We can talk more about this. But just to talk a little bit about spot colors, so I have some colors like a Pantone color or it might be a custom color named for the customer's brand or whatever it is. I look it up on my digital front end on my RIP in a library that tells me for that spot color what are the LAB values. So basically I've gotten out of the need for an input profile because the spot color library tells me exactly what the device independent values the LABs are and I can take those LABs just like I did for all my other color management convert them through the output profile for my device and find the best CMYK combination what I sometimes call the recipe to simulate that spot color on my output device. And again, that assumes we have the gamut to do so. We'll talk more about that in the next session. Okay, thanks, Lou. This concludes the 101 on color basics, just to get started with the three key steps. And we have a great resource if you want to reinforce your knowledge and share it with your colleagues and also your customers. This is the ABCs of Color Guide we have available on our website. And here is the link. And you can also go to efi.com 
click on resources, select educational downloads, and select ABC guides. Now Lou will continue with uh, the three key steps to getting the color right. The moment you've all been waiting for. Let's actually yeah. talk about how to make this work with your RIP and your digital output device. I'm going to talk today about three key steps to getting the color right. We're going to start by talking about the settings on the RIP, and getting the settings basically to match our applications, but we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. And then we're going to talk in some detail about two additional key steps to matching color consistently and succeeding with color management in your organization. So the second thing we'll talk about is the calibration of the digital output device through the RIP. And finally, we'll talk about how we make those ICC profiles and how we can apply those on the RIP to perform the color management that we've been talking about. So let's start with the settings. The easiest way to understand the settings that you want to put on your digital front end or your RIP for your digital output device is going to be to look at the source of the documents. Remember that there are documents created with RGB source images, with CMYK, and with spot color, so your document and your PDF or whatever the source is might have a whole lot of different color spaces that you're going to have to think about. I want to remind you, and we'll show you a link to this at the end, that in our previous World of Fiery webinar, Chris Ripka did an excellent job talking about the anatomy of documents and designing for digital. So if you've not seen that session, you might want to go back and look at the recording of that. But knowing now that I have to deal with RGB and CMYK, it's pretty obvious that I'm going to have to set up these, to make some choices about this on my RIP. And the way I'm going to match these settings is I'm going to simply look at my design applications and see how they're configured. Now you might get a surprise later today or whenever you get to this and you go around and look at the all the designers workstations in your operation or the four or five different production machines you might have producing jobs it is very typical that these settings are not matching from one copy of the Adobe Creative Suite to another that's really essential to getting consistent color in your shop so we can use Adobe Bridge and it's beyond the scope of this discussion today but you can look up how to use Adobe Bridge to synchronize those settings once we've settled on how we're going to work so I've pick something basically equivalent to the North America general defaults in Photoshop here with sRGB for my RGB images being used as the Photoshop or the other application working uh, space and Grackle for the CMYK working space you can see down below here and I am showing you a little fiery interface here since that's the DFE, DFE that we have the best access to here that I'm going to simply set my CMYK source to match my application my RGB source to match my application. Okay? Very good. Now, as uh, Lou mentioned, if you are interested in getting more details on how to make sure every other aspect of file preparation is done right for digital print, we have additional resources with great tips for you and your customers. End of last year, we hosted the first World of Fire webinar where we shared the best practices for preparing files for digital print. So uh, you can get a recording, we can pro uh, and here's the link in the YouTube channel. We also have a great white paper, color settings white paper, that gives you more details on what Lou just explained. And we also recommend the Adobe Creative Suite printing guide, so you can find it just by Googling uh, this or uh, typing this short URL we provide you here. Now let's continue with Lou covering calibration. Okay. Before I talk to you about calibration and what it does and honestly how important it is, I'm leading a little bit there, I wanted to ask you a poll question which you should see on your screen now. You could just answer this and submit and you, the window should disappear. You may need to close it to continue to see the slides, but essentially we're polling you to learn about what you know about calibration or basically how frequently you calibrate your digital print system and I will, before we finish talking about calibration, give you some guidelines for that. So the notion of calibration is to maintain consistent tone reproduction on your device. So if you go back to the days of conventional image setters on film or if you have plate setters, it's the same notion of saying if I have a 50% dot in the source file on my cyan channel, I need to get a 50% dot on the plate 
or on the output or on the film back in that day. Calibration on a digital front end is essential to give you consistency from day to day. And if you go back to those film or have plates that are making plates, you understand that, right? If I don't calibrate on a very regular basis, my color is going to be all over the place. Maybe more importantly on a digital device, the process of calibration will compensate for environmental fluctuations. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, but your digital press is probably even a little more sensitive than your conventional press to some environmental variables such as temperature and humidity. Finally, calibration keeps our colors in a known state. So this means that I can easily go back and do reprints of a job that the customer accepted in a week or a day or a month and they'll be satisfied with that. So what does calibration do? Calibration essentially measures the tonal steps on your output device with no calibration and then creates a curve to linearize the device or get us in equals out, the dots that we want. So in the example I'm showing you here, you can see that the first three steps of this step wedge are basically all at the same value. There's not enough ink or toner being put down. And at the shadow end, I'm plugged up from 80% on. I'm all at 100% essentially. If I measure this and I create a correction curve, then I can calibrate. The calibrated result is going to look like this. As you see, I've opened up the tone scale in the shadow end, and I've given myself evenly stepped tonal values in each step of the step wedge, including in that highlight end. If you look at the bottom of this slide, you can see what I was trying to achieve, which is that each step in the tone scale is equal. Okay, so we're in a linear state now, which means that we're going to be very repeatable, and also we're going to put ourselves into a good place for the next step of making an ICC profile. So to summarize, calibration establishes even gradation. Showed you some examples of the 10% and 75% patch. This is an example visually of what an uncalibrated and calibrated result would look like. So there's before and after. You can see that we've really opened things up with our calibration. We haven't necessarily gotten the color right, but we'll talk more about that in a second. So let's talk about the variables that affect calibration. Here are the key things you need to look out for or think about when you ask yourself the question, are we okay to keep printing or is it time that we should calibrate again? The first thing is media changes. Basically all the substrates that you put in your press are going to require a different calibration. If you print on 12 or 15 different stocks, you can probably find a way to normalize those down to a plane and a mat and a coated and et cetera like that to sort of share some calibrations. But as you're getting started and trying to really precisely match color from one device to another or one paper stock to another, you should make the assumption that every substrate may require its own calibration. And so that tells me something which we'll talk about in a minute. People ask, very common question, so how often should I calibrate? One good way to gauge that is to say, when you're changing from running one job for the last three hours to another one that's going to use a different paper, that's probably a good time to calibrate that paper right before you do a job on it. Second thing we need to think about is press technology and speed. So speed goes more to conventional devices, offset and flexographic devices, and even gravure to a certain degree, are sensitive to the speed at which you run the press the tonal characteristics, the dot gain changes. So if we linearize plates for a conventional device, we run them at a certain speed when we did our test to confirm we're calibrated or whatever next step is. If we change the speed later, we might have to recalibrate that plating system. In terms of digital devices, it's really about the press technology and how much the press tries to normalize itself before it starts printing. So if you have a high-end digital toner press, you're probably going to see that it sits around for a minute or two before anything comes out and it says I'm preparing or uses some other term on the on the screen that's where it's trying to get itself straightened out and so those devices typically need calibrated less frequently than something that might be an entry-level device that as soon as you say print starts putting out color pages for you print settings also affect this so calibration is directly tied or tonal reproduction is directly tied to the halftone screen you use, 
and the resolution at which you run your device. So this isn't a big gotcha, it's just a warning that if I calibrate for my 12-point coded paper on 1200 DPI with a round 200 dot screen or whatever they call it, that's the way that I need to run my jobs because that's where the calibration is going to be correct. And as I change screens or resolutions, the tonal characteristics change, chances are my calibration isn't going to be as effective. The last thing is the environmental variables. Temperature is a contributor to this. Humidity is a huge contributor to this. And you probably know this even if you have conventional presses. You know, if you try to gray balance your conventional press, we find that it, after about the three-quarter tone, there's really not much point in trying to get the gray balance right because as humidity changes in the press room, your three-color trap changes in those three-quarter tones. Digital devices are the same way. They're sensitive to humidity across an even broader part of the tonal scale. So if, unless I'm in a humidity-controlled environment, which maybe one or two of you have built such a room for your digital device, but if it's just sitting out on the shop floor, as humidity changes, I'm going to need to recalibrate because my tonal characteristics of the digital press are going to, to vary. And so this is the big question. People say, how often should I calibrate? A couple of ideas for you. The first one is, after the engine is warmed up, we should not calibrate on the first sheet out in the morning when the engine is cold and everything's being turned on in the shop. When we warm up the press, 10 or 20 sheets later, it's going to be different. The second thing is, before a large job, so this is a way that I think to work. If we can batch together our jobs, so I have 10 jobs to print, let's say between now and lunchtime, and three of them go on one paper stock, and the rest of them go on another paper stock, chances are I'll try to put them together unless there's some customer emergency. I'll run all the jobs on the first sheet after calibrating that sheet, and then I'll calibrate the other sheet and run the rest of the jobs. The other time we need to do this is when we have media changes. Um, so again, as you change the papers, that's a, the time to do it. I have some results for you here from the poll. All right. Let's do that. There you go. This is what we got from the questions about the calibration. Looks like we're pretty evenly distributed through daily, weekly, and monthly with a few that never or just don't know if calibration is going on. Any get, thoughts? Get a pretty high score for the group. That's certainly right. My belief, it depends on your standard, right? It depends a little bit on your tolerance and your customer's tolerance for color variation, but daily or weekly are almost certainly the right answer. I guarantee you the humidity shot in your shop changes over a month, so that would probably be a little bit on the light side. Weekly is acceptable for certain color tolerance. If you're one of those, you know, three delta E, everything has to match Grackler Fogra within two or three delta E every minute of the day, then you're probably on a daily basis or probably even on a per shift basis or something like that. We didn't give you that option. All right. So let's finish talking about calibration just to say, show you how this works and then we'll, we'll talk about what we did. So we're going to give you a demonstration of calibration. We are demonstrating this on a fiery. I'm trying to be as non-denominational as I can today, but uh, this is what we have access to, right? So this is the Fiery interface. I'm going to choose the calibrator. When I calibrate, I've got to tell the system which paper I want to calibrate for. So I pick the paper, and of course I have to load that in the press and tell it which tray and so on that it's going to be pulled from. What instrument I want to measure it with. When I get my patch page back, I'm going to use the spectrophotometer to measure it, so I'm being asked to calibrate the spectrophotometer here. And now we're going to measure each strip. So first we'll measure the cyan strip, which looks like this. I have the invisible man scanning for you today. <laughs> and I won't take you through the rest of that, but we'd repeat first magenta, yellow, and black. Get our complete measurements. And then out here we can apply these settings, which will create a new calibration curve based on the tonal characteristics I just measured. And we can go back to printing. Okay? So what have we achieved by calibration? We have moved ourselves from the state you see here in this circle, which is where our color is clearly all over the place, to a state where our color is consistent, which you see at the top here. So we've gotten it to where our color is now landing where we can expect it. 
it's not where we want it yet. It's not in the middle of the bullseye, but it is printing in a consistent and more predictable fashion. And that's always the first step. It's the minimum requirement to get good color in your shop is to calibrate your device on a regular basis. So let's talk about the next step, which is creating an ICC profile. The first thing I want to talk to you about is that we're going to make a profile that does a couple things. It defines the gamut of the print system. As we know, we need to know the gamut to do our color management. And we're going to have some options here because you wouldn't be able to use your digital press if it didn't come with profiles. So you're automatically going to always have a plain profile and a coded profile and depending on the manufacturer of your rip, maybe more for different paper types. Those factory profiles, if you calibrate on the same paper they were created for, will give you a very good result. But if I want to get into that better range where I can compete better or I can talk about my tolerances or matching to some standard or some reference like a G7 kind of world or something like that, I'm going to have to make my own profiles. So best practice is to make my own profiles. The reasons are I want to print on my own paper. I want to change my print settings to use the resolution and halftone screen that I think look the best for my customers. And finally, I have a press different than the one at the manufacturer where they made that profile, which means my press might have a little bit different mechanical characteristics, might be at a different place in its service cycle, and almost certainly it's going to be in a different environment at a different temperature and humidity than where the press was when they made the factory profile. So again, factory profile is good. Please calibrate just so you get predictable results even if they're not perfect. But if you want to get the best results, this is where we talk about and I'm going to show you a quick demonstration here of how we create an ICC profile. So the first thing is to understand about creating this profile, I need two sets of values. Remember in our little primer at the beginning of today, we talked about how a profile always has one set of device values and one set of device independent values. So for an output profile, it's pretty easy to guess that the device values are going to be CMYK. And I get these from a standard chart, such as you see here. This is an IT873, a 928 patch target that I can use to create a profile. I know the device values. I know what the CMYK values are for every one of those patches on this chart. The second set of values I'm going to need are device independent values. I'm going to need those LAV values or some device independent values from a spectrophotometer. Now I can make that index, that lookup table that we call an ICC profile that says for each combination of device colors, so just for instance for the patch that is 0% uh, cyan and magenta and 100% yellow and 0% black, I know what that looks like in LAB space. Now I can create a mapping so that when somebody comes into me with an LAB value and says I need this LAB value and I look it up and I say well that's my pure yellow, I'll know to print pure yellow for that pixel. I'm going to need some software to do this obviously since you're probably not going to craft your own ICC profile in Microsoft Excel. Color Profiler Suite is what we have here at EFI, and again, I'm trying to be non-denominational, but we're just going to use that at least for our demo. So let's show you a demonstration of how this works. It's really not as hard as it seems. There's some tricky parts as far as how to print the patches and how to set up your black generation, unless you have an old scanner operator hanging around your shop still. Other than that, it's really about how to measure the patches and load the profile. So I'm in Color Profiler Suite. I'm going to print the patches. Color Profiler Suite does connect directly to the digital front end of the RIP, so it sends the patches for me with the right calibration in place and so on and the right settings as far as the way I need to print the patches to make a profile. I'm reminded right there about calibration. And I tell the system how, I, how many patches I want to print and what device I want to use to measure them. So we're using that same patch target I, told, I showed you earlier, but formatted for this X-ray device. And because I'm connected directly to the print system, I'm showing my job properties here so I can pick my tray and my resolution and halftone screen and all that that I've done my calibration for. And then we're going to measure this on this I.O. table. So I put the patch page in. I need to show the system the corners of the patch page to set it up. And then basically it's 
Kind of like watching a machine in Detroit making a car, only not nearly as fast. <laughs> so here's my measurements. I'm going to save these. The color profiler suite is going to give me a little information about what I measure. I'm going to go to my expert settings. We have a benefit here. We can cheat on the fiery. We can pick the profile that's already on the rip for a similar type of paper and we get all those factory default settings. So we don't need a scanner operator to do this. We have one that figures these things out internally. And finally, I need to load that thing. And it's remember, we're already hooked to the rip, so it's just going to go right on the rip. The last step, I'm going to play a little Julia Child here on you and not make you watch the entire process of generating profile, which does take several minutes to make all these tables that are in the profile. Finally, when I'm done, I'm going to go back to my color settings. And I'm going to pick that profile. And that's what you see right here. I've created a new output profile. And I'm going to pick it. It's linked to the calibration set that I made for that paper. And now I'm ready to get really, really consistent and high quality color. So if we go back to our where are we now diagram, we went from being un uncalibrated to calibrated. So we got very consistent but not very accurate. Now we're in the upper right corner that we've profiled. Not only are we consistent, but we're consistently hitting a standard. And again, your standard is probably something like Swap or Grackle or maybe Fogra, depending on where you're listening from today. But these are typically the industry references that we try to match our presses to so that we know they're consistent from device to device and so that we can win those really picky customers that require these kinds of things. So before I review what we've learned, we have left some time here for Q&A. So I want you to just start to think about any questions you may have written down or maybe you're already typing them in. I'm not watching the WebEx, but you can start to send some questions my way that will take in a few minutes. Uh, what we learned today was why does color management matter? So Veronica talked to you about how color management can contribute to consistency, which by definition leads to better profitability in our printing business. Okay, that's the bottom line is that it's all about the money. And if our color's inconsistent, we're going to wind up with unhappy customers and doing reprints, which at least if you're on a digital device and you have to reprint something, you've basically lost all your profit right in that click. Okay, so that's why this stuff is so important. I then took you through a primer, the Color Basics 101, just to make sure we all understood about RGB and CMYK and spectrophotometers and ICC-based color management. Hopefully that was helpful to some of you or many of you. And then finally, we talked about the three keys to succeeding, which is matching the settings on your RIP to your application color settings, calibrating the output device for the paper that you're going to print on with the halftone screen and resolution settings and all that stuff that affect the tonality. And then finally, for the best possible quality, making a custom profile for that output system on that paper in your environment with all those settings. Thank you, Lou. And uh, as you type your questions, uh, we would like to remind you that all people who registered today have access to three online courses. And we are giving you the username and password to get them all for free. The courses are Optimizing Color and Consistency, Spot Color Accuracy, and Introduction to Fiery Color Profiler Suite. Uh, and don't worry if you don't take down notes on the password right now, we'll be sending you an email with all these details on where to go and what the username and password is. But that's not all. If you want to capitalize the knowledge and experience acquired with a formal certification, we have another exclusive offer to everyone who attends all three color webinars. Um, we give you a 10% discount or $25 of the fiery professional certification. So make sure you register to the second and third sessions on April 16th and April 30th. The details on how to use this coupon will be communicated right after the color webinar on April 30th. 
and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the second session on April 16th about producing the best match for spot colors where you can learn the latest in spot color matching to differentiate your business and maintain accurate, accurate color output every time. The last session will be about matching industry color standards where you will learn how to make your printers match an industry or a customer standard by understanding the latest specifications and methods. And that's not all. One more little thing. We created a new web page that will make it easy for Fire users to find all the great educational downloads and support resources and get it by going to resources.efi.com slash fiery. Now let's uh, start gathering your questions and we'll answer as many as you can as yeah. we can today. Yeah, we have quite a few, so we'll see how many we can get mm. through and respect your time. So Lou, take it away, let's start. A lot of good questions. I'm just gonna take it from the top here. Um, the first question is, for a better explanation of the gray and black selection and color setups, and when we showed you the fiery color setup, there's some settings for gray and black there. Um, and questions about RGB and CMYK. The reason for the gray and black settings is to do a trick that we kind of call around here PAGUBO, P-G-U-B-O, which stands for print gray using black only. From a business perspective, if a customer comes to you with a job that appears to be black and white, and you quote it as black and white, and then you throw it on your digital print engine and you get charged color clicks, you're going to have a very bad business model going on. So the reason for these black settings is so that I can print using black only. That might be because the customer created a CMYK document using 000 CMY and just something in the K channel, but they didn't make it grayscale, so the press or the rib thinks it's color. Might also be that they've even created something in RGB that might just have R equals G equals B, perfect grays all over the place. They don't want to pay for the color toners. So that's the reason for these settings. And in general, I would set the gray and black settings. Basically, you can turn on this gray and black handling for RGB and CMYK separately. I would set RGB to text and graphics, because I don't want you to have dropouts and images where you might have equal pixel values in RGB. And I would set the CMYK to everything, text, graphics, and images. Anybody that's creating a faux black and white document using CMYK and there's nothing but black ink and everything, that's the way you want to print it. It'll save you a ton of money. Okay? Um, there's also questions, part of the same question about the um, separate LAB to R R G separate RGB to CMYK. This is a really an old proofing function. It says, I know that I have sRGB coming in, let's say, because that's my RGB setting. But I don't want to color manage that to my output space and get the maximum possible gamut I can on my press. Instead, I want to see the way it would look if I converted it through my CMYK source profile. So maybe you've picked Swap or Grackle. That separate button will cause it to convert the sRGB to Swap or Grackle, then to the output device. And the only reason I'd really do that is if you're making proofs on your digital print engine, which is probably not a hugely profitable thing to do these days. Next question, what technology in device independent color spaces gives it the complete gamut? Well, the answer is it's imaginary. Not imaginary, but it's defined by a scientific experiment in 1931. They measured the eyes of many, many people in Paris and repeated this experiment in 1964 to better sort of get more people involved in it and get more nationalities and gender and all that stuff expanded. And that experiment defines all the colors we can see. So the device independent color space is just taking that total range of the human visual system and putting a metric on it, right? Quantifying it so that I have some numerical system to say what the color looks like and we're not sitting on the phone saying, well, you know, it's that really super bright red like the fire truck. You can say, well, no, it's LAB of this. The next question. Designers are using swap as a color space. Most common standard in the field, absolutely agree. Question is, should we encourage them to switch to Grackle? This is a great question. So for years and years we had swap in this country and that's because there was no other printing standard until 2006 in the US. Quick historical note here, if you look at Europe, the Fogre standards are up to like 
Fugger 41 or something, the Fugger standards have been coming for about 30 years. We never really standardized on what swap printing was. Even in fact, until 2006, there wasn't really a good definition of how to create a swap print. You could look up what they did in the TR001 data set, which is what that swap profile is made from, but there wasn't really good instructions for how to do that on a conventional press. Digital side, you don't care, because you can pick a profile and match TR001 or the newer swap data set 2006 perfectly. The reason that you would switch to Grackle is because you want to get a little bit more gamut from your output device. And basically, if you take the Grackle profile and the uh, swap profile, and you use a profile comparison tool, and there's a bunch out there, you might even be able to do it in the color sync utility on the Mac, compare them with your output profile. Is the output profile for your press and paper bigger than swap? If it is, then going to Grackle will give you a little bit more colorful reproductions. The trade-off is your high-quality stocks, your coded, a uh, few other high-quality stocks, your heavy stocks, are likely to have enough gamut to do Grackle. But if you're doing fast and cheap work on some kind of plain paper or some kind of matte finish paper, you're not going to get enough gamut to match Grackle. So swap is actually still a really good compromise that you can match on both a low and high quality sheet if that's important to you. Coming down here, uh, the next question is, this is a fiery specific question to the calibrator. It says, what if the measured value is lower than the target value? How do you justify this to your end you to cut your print buyer? The answer is, you can't. So, if you are calibrating and you're seeing that the press can't achieve the density that that calibration set expects, basically you have two choices. You can call service, which may not help you if the press is new and just serviced. Chances are you're using a calibration set that we made for a paper that has more gamut, that gets more density than your paper. So this is a classic example I mean, unless it's terrible, like you're off by 20 or 30 points. But if you're 5 or 10 points down on the density scale from the target, that's a perfect example of a case where you should make your own calibration set for your paper and your settings, and then probably go on and make a profile too, because the factory profile is also going to expect that higher density. Another calibrator question. The calibrator in the fiery has a button that says restore. That basically is a bail me out button. That just says, you know, I've been calibrating for a long time and I'm not getting consistent results anymore. I typically don't see any reason to use that or maybe every you know, six months or something somebody goes in there and restores, but typically that shouldn't be required. Best humidity level, great question. Well, the answer is 50% probably to be generic, but it would be impossible to maintain a room at 50% humidity. So if you get a hygrometer and put it by your press, which is a great idea, you, if you're in the range of 45 to 55%, you're going to be super consistent. And if you can maintain that, then you really could go to calibrating maybe once a day or even once a week or something like that. Question about calibration. When the curves are out of whack and how do you read them? Do you have any examples? It's a hard one for me to take on the World of Fiery um, call here. If I could ask you to go to the Fiery forums, there's a Fiery color forum. We'll put a link up for you on that at the end. Put this in there. Maybe you have a screenshot shot of some wacky result you've gotten, and I'll be happy to comment there or show some examples. Settings, a uh, question about what settings affect my output or my color gamut. And really, it's the DPI and the uh, screen, screen ruling. So whatever you pick for the screen ruling, DPI, if you keep that consistent, there's a few other image quality settings that would have a small effect, but not a, not a very big one. Sorry, I lost my place here. Does creating a dub ice link profile increase the match to a standard like Grackle? Well, as with so many things in color management, the answer is it depends. If your press has the gamut to match Grackle, again, using a profile compar comparison tool can show you, and you're not achieving the delta ease you want, then yes. Device linking one or two iterations with a medium to large size target will definitely get you closer or perfectly to Grackle. Do you have to purchase Fiery profiling software? It depends, just like everything in color management. Some of our partners ship color profiler suite with the Fiery, with the press, especially presses that have inline spectrophotometers always include color profiler suite. 
In other cases, we bundle it, and to answer your question, yes, you have to buy it if it did not come with your press. Monitor calibration with Spider. We don't support the Spider, but Color Profiler Suite does calibrate monitors with the ES2000 that we ship with it, which is our model of the uh, x ray i1 Pro 2. How to check the quality of a new output profile? That's a great question, too. You know, the simplest thing to do is, if you have the Graphic Arts package on the Fire, you turn on Control Bar, but if wherever environment you're in, get a Control Bar, like the Idea Alliance, uh, probably the two-row Idea Alliance target, put it in the center of a sheet, print it through your fully color managed thing that you just set up with your profile and calibration and all that, measure it in, it's only about 46 patches, and then you can compare it to uh, your reference. So you can compare it either to the swap standard or the Grackle standard or whatever you've set your CMYK source for and look at your very your, your values. If your average delta E on a digital device is under 5, certainly if it's around 3 you're really hitting it out of the park. If your max is I'd say under 8 or 10, depending again on just how picky you are, you're in a pretty good place. Fiery RGB, this is a good question. So this is custom space that we shipped on Fireys for a long time and we still include it for people that might be using it in their workflow but this was basically a modified profile that we made to try to solve the old my blues turn purple on color management problem and that's not really a problem anymore with much better precision devices and much better precision output profiles you can safely use sRGB for your source or Adobe the difference between those two is Adobe RGB is bigger um, you can kind of gauge this from your customer. If your customer is bringing you in work that has photographs that were captured on a consumer level camera, they're probably sRGB space. If they have a digital SLR and they're either shooting Adobe RGB or shooting RAW and using something like Aperture or the Camera RAW module to convert, then they're probably using Adobe RGB. You can also open up one of their images in Photoshop and see what's embedded, and that might be the right setting for that customer. Multiple sites, do you need multiple versions of the profiler suite? Well, you kind of do only in that you need to have a spectrophotometer at every site. You're not going to be very productive shipping a spectrophotometer around unless you're kind of within the same town. But the spectrophotometer does unlock the software. So if you were in the same city or something, you could certainly buy one copy, put it at all three, you know, shove your locations and pass the spectro around. But you're going to get into a problem there where something's going to go off the wire at two places at once and you're not going to be able to fix it. How many press profiles do I need? Uncoded and coded? Sure, at a minimum. Depends on your tolerance. Um, if you have uncoded and coded sheets that vary in terms of their white point uh, or vary at all in terms of their coding or their thickness, these things are going to require changes. Remember, in a digital press, when I go from uncoded to coded or from a thick to a thin sheet, a lot of things physically change inside that press. Unlike the conventional press where we have to get out there with wrenches and stuff if we want to change the impression pressure, these things adjust themselves in digital print engines. So yes, as you go from uncoded to coded, that's going to be a different profile. If I go from coded to something like heavy coded, that's probably a different profile too. So um, due to time, we'll take just one last question. We want to respect our audience's time. And uh, we have many questions that we did not get to. We will, I think, put together sort of an FAQ and share that with everybody because there's just a lot of great questions. So let's take this last one. Yes. So the last question I have here is, says, Command Workstation wants me to calibrate with an ES-1000, but I have an ES-2000. Lucky you, because that's a much more precise and newer device. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. All everything that you see that asks for ES-1000 will support the ES-2000 in compatibility mode. It acts like an ES-1000, so its lights aren't going to light up in the right way, it's not going to let you measure the different new measuring modes like M0, M1, M2. It's just going to be whatever it is, which is probably an M2 UV cut device, but for purposes of calibration, that doesn't matter at all. If you're going to start to make sophisticated profiles, or start to match some of these like latest 2013 standards that use these specific measuring modes, then you might need to get some software that supports it. But really that only matters on the profiling side. Color Profiler Suite would support that. So from the command workstation, calibration perspective, you can use an ES2000 with basically any fiery in the world that I know of and it will calibrate it just as effectively as an ES1000. All right. 
Well, that was an hour full of great information. I want to thank our presenters, Lou and Veronica, and you, our audience, thank you for joining us today. Hope you uh, take away a lot of uh, great information. We will follow up with a recording. Many of you asked also if the presentation will be available. We'll share that with you. We're glad that everybody found this very um, helpful. So have a great rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks when we have our next World of Fiery webinar. Take care.